Hi, it's time for Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. This is Lori Watson, sex therapist and author, with my co-host Tony Del Medico, psychotherapist. And we are here to talk about all things intimate and sexual and help you get the most out of your sex life. You can check us out on the web at foreplayrst.com. Tell us what you want to hear about and let us know what you think of the program. Lori, sex talk today. Where is foreplay going to lead us? Tony, today we're going to talk about how to be turned down without being wounded. Ouch. Um, my, my poor ego is already bruised just thinking about this topic. Uh-huh. Saying no without wounding your partner. Yeah, sounds like it's a difficult one. What do we do when our partner asks us for sex and we're not in the mood? I'm thinking about how it was when we were dating versus now that we're married or now that we've been together for five or ten years. Somehow something shifts. Mm-hmm. It seems like the rejections uh, when we're dating um, don't cut as deeply, I, I don't think, somehow. Are um, there rejections when we're dating? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any? When did they occur? I mean, usually not as much, right? It does seem when we're dating, I think, that we're in perfect sync with each other in terms of our desire matches our partner's desire, and boom, you know, they ask, we want, we want, they want. It's very great. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think the whole the whole dance is a look toward the sunny side. So even if there is, you know, I'm tired, let's go on to bed, it, it doesn't sink in as deeply. And, and I think um, in previous episodes we've talked about some of the harder parts of our partners that we start to um, come face-to-face with. And so when we're rejected, I think um, – it may be part of that shadow stuff again, creeping into the relationship. Mm-hmm. So, sure. I mean, the ways that our families maybe didn't meet our needs suddenly crops up as more monstrous in our head. We kind of see through our partner's face back to the ghosts of the past, and we think, "Oh, here it comes again." Somebody who doesn't care about my needs, who isn't going to meet my needs. I, I think the other thing about a sexual rejection is there. There's a fantasy. That our partner will be sexual when we are sexual, feel that. And it's it's kind of the fantasy that we have um, as children. You know, our mother will meet our needs when without being asked, you know, that she just knows what they are. And so when, when we're feeling horny or feeling desire and our partner feels sud- suddenly different, it's the shock to our system. Like, what? What's going on? You know, and it feels really bad. And then if they say no, or if they don't say no, you know, yes, if they don't say no tactfully, um, it can hurt our feelings and it can remind us of our needs not met and sort of start that whole downward cycle. No, I would agree. And I think you're touching on not just in with respect to intimacy, but I think in general, the more time you spend with your partner, the more you think you can read the other person's mind or the more you're thinking they should be able to read yours. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the you wish. Should, yeah. I, I, I think the, the reality is that we learn how different they are. You know, uh, my husband likes to say, you know, one day I was I went to bed and I woke up with the alien. You know, <laughs> I mean, just who I was was so different than he had imagined. Um, I, I mean, we really are not the same people. And I think when we're dating we like to pretend we're the same people, that we're just so alike, and we're so alike in our tastes and our values, and then suddenly we realize, no, this person has a whole separate world. They feel differently, and and especially in sex, it can be so different. No, I would agree, and, and I think we're, we're touching on something here just with the topic, how to say no without wounding. We've talked in the past about the walls or the defenses that couples put up between themselves, and it's my opinion in working with the men and the couples that come into my consulting room that the base of the wall oftentimes is built in repeated um, refusals to repeated open to your rejection. partner. Yeah, the rejection. That and, their partner is rejecting them. Yeah, and, and I think when you receive that rejection, I mean you have to do a whole lot of self-talk just to get through the wounding mm-hmm. part of it and put it past you to put yourself mm-hmm. out there for another mm-hmm. ask. Uh, and so with each rejection, I think, is another layer of bedrock in that wall. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think a lot of times when couples come in or, or individuals are in pain in their relationships, it's typically around a lack of intimacy. And typically at the base of that are these rejections that sometimes have gone on for a decade or more. Mm-hmm. And um, I do think that men bear the brunt of rejection because they're the ones more willing often to initiate sex. And I, I think it's something so important to – take note of if you're a female uh, and you don't initiate very much, 
that initiation is an act of vulnerability, right? I mean, asking for sex and getting the whole balls rolling is is really um, a tough act in terms of giving ourselves and exposing ourselves to our partner. And I think women often think, oh, you know, he just wants it all the time. And so they don't realize what it costs him to ask. And so they don't count their rejections as potentially wounding him. Right. I would agree. And um, and stereotypically, I think that's true. But coming to um, giving a voice to the men that I work with mm-hmm. who come in who have a lower libido than their partners, for example, mm-hmm. I have a, a, hand, a number of men that come in and say, my partner wants to have sex almost every day. And I'm a once or twice a week kind of guy. And so the amount of wounding that goes on that she's receiving mm-hmm. day in and day out is is also devastating. So mm-hmm. he's – and he knows he's turning her down and he knows what that feels like as well. So it can be fairly devastating both ways. But you know, historically and stereotypically, I think men are portrayed as being the, the aggressor. But for those of you listening, regardless, somebody's receiving a rejection. And it's mm-hmm. going to be causing um, a big wound if you're you're both not able to talk about it and, and work through it. So, and I, I do think a woman who gets turned down, um, oftentimes I say, you know, the world population would end if it were up to women to initiate. Because even if she has solid desire, if she gets turned down once, I mean, oftentimes she will never ask again, even if she feels desire. And I think you know, men get turned down all the time, and they. Keep asking and asking and asking. And I would say for the low desire male partner who turns down the female, I think that one additional difficulty for a female is is culturally and probably hormonally, truthfully, men are more are initiating more often. And so she's listening to all her girlfriends say, my husband can't keep his hands off me. He's always pawing at me. Everybody at the cocktail party is saying that. No one is saying my husband doesn't want it. And so what does she, you know, do with that? Usually what she do, does with that is she thinks, I'm not attractive. I mean, that is and, – and these are – I mean, often I see couples, as you do, uh, and these women are attractive. They, they're they in good shape. I mean, they can be beautiful women, but for whatever reason, he has lower desire. And so he's the, the turner downer, And but it really hits her psyche, I think, differently than a man being turned down sexually. Yeah. So we're talking about a rejection being very different. Um From the feminine side versus the masculine. I think there is a difference. Hmm. Yeah. And I think there is a difference in terms of just the way we – our bodies run, right? Um, Men have so much more testosterone, you know, like a thousand times often, literally a thousand times more than a woman. Uh, A thousand to 300 is kind of the range for a guy. That's nanograms per deciliter for anybody who cares out there. And that's uh, an amount in your blood, and so think about a thousand as an 18 year old guy who is just horny all the time. And at 300, these men have very low desire. So they come in and they say, you know, my erections don't work. Um, I think about sex about once a week, but if my wife doesn't, you know, if she hurts my feelings or if, you know, we have a fight, I don't want to do it. Viagra doesn't work very well on my erections. That's at a level of 300. And most women's, their testosterone range is 70 to two. And 70 starts when she's 18. You know, we all think women peak for their desire when they're 35. And actually women come into their own in terms of their self-image and their ability to ask. But their hormonal peak is when they're 18. And 70 is, you know, a tiny amount of testosterone down to about half that when she's 40 and infinitesimal when she is menopausal. So her physiological hunger is much less. And I think this turndown problem, in part, uh, is often caused by these differences in physiological hunger. He is hungry so much more, gets turned down so much more. She isn't as hungry, doesn't understand perhaps mentally how wounding that is to him and how that, you know, how they need to negotiate this. So, I mean, I see one of the biggest problems in terms of the wounding is, you know, what do we do with these frequency differences? Uh, and how do we help people through them to negotiate them so one person doesn't feel drowned by requests and the other person doesn't feel starved by not enough sex? Right. I'm I'm thinking about um, you know with premarital counseling, for example, 
would be a wonderful conversation point for couples who are thinking about getting together. What? How are we going to negotiate these times when there's going to be moments where you're interested and I'm not? And, and I think that's true at any stage in your relationship. I think so, too. And I, I've taught premarital classes for many, many years. I will say oftentimes when you're getting married, you know, it just doesn't enter your – it doesn't touch your radar in terms of – how well, this that's, might never be gonna be that's, that's never going to be us. It's never going to happen. Not us. Yeah, that's somebody else's we'll problem. We never have sexual problems. Everybody has sexual problems. Everybody does at yeah. some point. Yeah. So and how do you negotiate through that? Well, let's come back to some of this, Tony. Sure. And this is Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy with Lori Watson and Tony Del Medico. We'll be right back. Wanting sex again. How to Rediscover Desire and Heal a Sexless Marriage by Certified Sex Therapist Lori Watson. Each chapter is designed to fix one of the problems that cause low libido from early marriage through the childbearing years, even all the way through menopause. I've also had men read it and tell me that for them it was the most hopeful thing they read about resolving sexual problems. Look for Wanting Sex Again on Amazon.com. You can also talk to Lori Watson for therapy in person or via Skype. I offer couples counseling and sex therapy and I think about both aspects of the relationship, emotional intimacy and sexual technique and that combination together helps marriages be happy improve your sex and improve your relationship with awakening center for couples and intimacy find out more at awakenloveandsex.com and sign up for their next couples retreat weekend hosted by Lori watson awakenloveandsex.com awaken what's possible Welcome back to Foreplay. I'm psychotherapist Tony Del Medico, and I'm here with my co-host Lori Watson. Today we're talking about how to say no to your partner without wounding. And Lori, in the first half of the show, we spent a considerable amount of time um, eventually getting to the place where saying no is a very normal and natural part of the relationship over time. And I think for couples, learning how to say no with, without wounding is very important. Um, mm-hmm. you, you spent some time giving some biological um, underpinning to the fact that just very naturally, there's there's oftentimes a big difference sometimes in the desire that each couple will have individually. So um, you're going to have – if you're not – if you haven't gotten to this bump in the road yet as a couple, sooner or later you're going to. And being able to to, to talk about negotiating that water um, is a, in a very, very um, empathic and sensitive way is really important. Yeah. What I, I like to call it a rain check. So if your partner asks you, you know, for sex – and you're not in the mood. Ba- basically, you know, just a light, playful way of saying, you know, hey, how about how about Saturday? And the thing is, if you are offering the rain check, that means you have to remember on Saturday to bring it back up. If you offer the rain check, it is your job, it is your responsibility to remember that you offered that and bring it back up on the day that you said that you would and have sex. Or, you know, if you're deathly ill or something, then you renegotiate. But but by and large, the person who offers the rain check is the responsible party to then reinitiate sex again. And I think this is, you know, this would really help a lot of couples who are frustrated because sometimes maybe somebody says, and it's genuine, you know, they're not in the mood, they're too tired, they're too whatever. And they say, you know, no, I, I really, I really can't tonight. And then they say, how about the weekend? And then they forget. And the partner begins to feel like this is just a brush off. This is just something that you're saying to me. Uh, you know, to put me off because you don't want to and you don't want sex anytime. And so, you know, it just adds to this frustration. And it, I think it that is when oftentimes the person who has been rejected starts to pout or, or you know, do some of the activities that, that don't add to a, a good cycle anyway. Although I think we can have powders out there <laughs> any day of the week, you know, just because they, they want their needs met. And, you know, and they feel entitled and on some level for those needs to be met. And they're having trouble seeing that their partner is in a different energy space. And so the no might feel wounding anyway, even if you give the best brain check in the world. Right, I would agree. <clears throat> and oftentimes that is the first sign between a couple where space immediately gets created. One, mm-hmm. The person who's rejected sometimes will get up and go in the other room. They may go downstairs and watch TV for the rest of the night. Uh, they may just sleep on the couch. So – and then – then the couple has to negotiate the the intimacy gap that's come between them. So uh, as you were talking, Laurie, I was thinking about 
this idea of saying no and the partner saying, you know, well, here's a rain check. Let's to get together over the weekend. And I don't know if this is going to sound stereotypical or not, but at least from a lot of the men that I visit with, after about three days with no intimacy, it is almost as if you've never had sex before ever. And there's never yeah. a chance that it's ever going to happen again. So yeah. something gets really kind of crazy in our in our in the I don't know how it is for a female, but in the male psyche, you really wind up in the desert very quickly. And the idea of, well, how about this weekend? You might as well say, how about 2017? If it's Monday. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, if it's Thursday, it seems like okay, forever. that's tomorrow. Yeah, but exactly. If it's Monday, yeah. it's forever. Or, yeah, or no. how about Friday night at 930 you know, after the kids are asleep? Right. Just give me something. Put a pot of gold under the rainbow instead of saying, well, you know, maybe a rainbow will come and maybe there'll be some gold there. Maybe not. But I know. Now, trust me, I'm good for it. And Tony, I, I think what you're saying is so important. There is something about this window of three days <laughs> that oh, seems okay. to be yeah. like a male cool. window in terms of, you know, they're starving. And if, if a meal isn't coming in three days, it, they get a little frantic and a little crazy. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I do think that in busy couples, um, you know, sometimes it's not quite enough, but even twice a week would be so much better. And, and that's like one quickie. And, you know, one longy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful you recipe. You know, that's like Tuesday and Saturday. Yeah. I just mean, something to keep us in the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think most couples that I talk to and most men individually, I mean, they all laugh and say, yeah, I want sex every day. Some of them do. Sure. Uh, male and female. But at mm-hmm. the end, after the laughing dies down, they say, well, you know, two or three times a week, you know, three or four on a great week and one or two on a down week. But on average, I think that two to three a week is, is I think, by and large, where most people have a thermostat set for mental health. Right. Anyway. And I, I think, though, that if you're dealing with a partner, usually a female partner, who has lower desire, and you say two or three times a week, I mean, she's she's going to feel a little swamped by that. Like, mm. oh, my gosh, I do not have time for this. That feels like I'm going to have to work up too much energy. You know, because frequently a sexual pursuer is becomes very sensitized to rejection and often has a very high sort of level of what their expectation is is going to happen. So if you're a sexual pursuer, I mean, in part, and you need sex more frequently, I mean, maybe you got to settle for less intense times in between. I mean, I think quickies are wonderful, especially if the woman uses a vibrator. That way she can kind of electronically catch up with his natural hormonal, you know, ability to have, you know, quick arousal and quick orgasm. Or maybe she doesn't want that. And I think if you are a sexual pursuer and your wife perhaps says, you know, I'm glad to make love to you tonight, honey. It's great. But I'm not hungry. I mean, you have to believe that. You have to accept the gift of love. Love is a great motivator for sex. I mean, many times men particularly tell me, but I want her to want it. It's like, okay, but she's not a male. I mean, she doesn't have as much testosterone. She probably does want it. She just doesn't want it as frequently. And so can you accept her gift of love that says, really, it's, it's not my night, but, you know, I'm glad to wrap my arms and legs around you and, you know, feel good with you because she often feels that as intimacy and closeness, but it's not her night to necessarily do the focus that she needs to do to reach orgasm. I see what you're saying. And we've talked in other shows about this pursuer distancer uh, mm-hmm. model, and, and I was wondering – I've, I've, in thinking about the men I've worked with over time, I'm not sure any man who's come in who's been having sex three times a week has demanded more. Yeah, I don't ever it's like have scratching men our come bellies. We are. tend to be fairly happy after a little while. <laughs> I don't while. ever have men but, come in that I've had sex three yeah, times a week. <laughs> right, but the ones, but the ones that aren't having any sex begin this really hot pursuit. Sure. So I'm really curious to know. Um, what comes first, the, the chicken or the egg here? Uh-huh. So if, if she withdraws or if he starts too much and yeah. Or once it's off her. the table, then he starts to get into a, a frantic pace and starts pursuing all of a sudden. I want more sex. I want more sex. And in reality, maybe he – in reality, if he's getting it three times a week, he's a happy camper by and large. And then there are weeks there are one or two times. He knows there's a nice pattern here of trust and gift and, yeah, and I th- gifting. I think when it is a good pattern – there is a relaxation. I mean, maybe he says, you know, I want it every day. But when he realizes that, you know, they have found their way through and there's a frequency that is decent, he starts to relax. And I, I would say couples often come in saying that same thing. You know, she's the chicken or he's the egg. And, and they want to figure out 
who started it. <laughs> and Lori, we're and paying no you to TikTok. tell us. Is it him or is it you know, me? <laughs> ching, ching. You know, <laughs> right. you go ahead and spend three sessions on that one. Yeah. You know, but it's like, to me, I would say the issue is how do we resolve this? How do we, how do we accept that we are different creatures sexually? And it's disappointing. I mean, the two big things in marriage that we deal with are disappointments about about often our disagreements and our differences. You know, we we are disappointed that our partner feels differently, wants things differently than we do, and is different than we imagine them. So, I mean, and, and how do you, how do you, right? Yeah. I mean, the chicken or the egg thing in terms of sexual frequency. Um, first of all, I mean, somebody asked me once, well, doesn't it come down to that I'm going to have to have a sex a lot more often than I really want to, and he's going to get sex a lot less than he does? And I said, Technically, yes, it comes down to that. But the heart of the matter that really resolves it is a deeper empathic understanding. There's a meta layer between couples that if we can get them to that place, they can resolve resolve that problem for eternity. Because, you know, if, if you really understand how deeply your partner feels sexuality as love, you know, that they that frantic thing that you talked about in men, it's not just I don't believe it's just about scratching the itch. I also believe it's about belonging, right. feeling connected to their partner. It's like it, it bathes them, if you will, in, in a way that allows them to be more vulnerable and open in the relationship. And for women, it, oftentimes, not, not all the time, and we work with the other case as well, but oftentimes she needs to be bathed essentially first in emotional connection before she wants to open up sexually. And, and there's always this, you go first. You go. You give me what I need so that I can give you what you need. You know, give me heat, I'll give you wood. Uh, and that, that doesn't work. I always say do the thing that your partner needs first. And I promise you in reasonable couples, in six months, it will resolve completely. Wonderful. So, so if you understand that meta level, like yeah. why do they need this? What does it say to them when, they're, when they get sex from me? Yeah. Lori, I, th- I think we've spent the bulk of our segment today talking about how couples can say no without wounding the other and having those conversations after the fact. The idea about a rain check is fabulous. I think it reframes it. So it's not even no, not tonight, but you know, giving them an option. How about Friday night at 830 and mm-hmm. making good on that is what mm-hmm. you're saying. Absolutely. I think I want to spend a few minutes talking about what you do in the moment. So mm-hmm. in the heat of the moment, when either partner is really aroused and really vulnerable and putting themselves out there and they're shut down, what do mm-hmm. you do as a couple with that aroused partner? Mm-hmm. Right. So do you have some thoughts around that for couples? You know, I think that it depends on the receiving person who, who's receiving the initiation and, and how far they can go. I mean, sometimes... Like we've said, maybe it's not a no. Maybe it's a partial no. It's like I, I I say this to couples and they just groan when I say this. But it's like, you know, I'm not up for it. Can I hold you while you masturbate? Mm. You know, I'm still connected and they're lying there. And, you know, a lot of people just that See, is that, such a private activity. They don't ever offer that. Up well, it's because. funny. We call it a, we call it a partial <laughs> no. But to me, as a guy, if, if I'm the one that's excited in the moment, that's almost a partial yes. Uh-huh, yeah. So I, I think that's a way of turning it into a positive and a way of, of a couple really being close while mm-hmm. the male pleasures himself or the female. Sure, uh, sure. And the partner can learn and, and watch. And oftentimes that can be a jump starter for the partner as well who is saying, well, I'm not really interested. And, and he or she all of a sudden finds themselves um, really excited by that. Right. I mean, I think sometimes the quickie is, you know, a, a no and a yes. It's like, yes, as long as the person who's providing the quickie, obviously the woman, who says, you know, yes, and her heart means I can, I can be with you, then it's a true yes. If it's like, okay, I'm just going to be the starfish and lay here, don't ever offer that. I mean, that, that yeah. is just so soul robbing and soul killing. I think that that is not a yes. So if you're going to say no, say no and mean it yeah. and then and then deal with the hurt feelings about it. Um, or, or offer up the opportunity of, you know, if you'd like to, to touch yourself, I'll be right here with you and mm-hmm. be close and and we can hold some space together under that situation. Mm-hmm. I think that can be actually very healing. You are uh, a psychotherapist. Hold some space together. What do you mean by that? Well, you're not leaving. You're not rolling over and saying you deal with your erection or you deal with your aroused pelvis. You're uh-huh. saying I get that you're attracted or turned on for whatever reason, whether right. it's just you haven't had it in a few days <clears throat> or you're really attracted to me right now. 
I'm going to honor that. I'm going to stay right here in the game with you and go ahead and masturbate. Mm -hmm. And the couples that have the courage to try that typically find that really redemptive and Mm -hmm. really healing in their relationship. They actually wind up not feeling rejected nine times out of ten. Mm Uh, and the couples uh, will check in the next morning and it, say, what was that like for you? I'm sorry I couldn't get myself in the mood. I appreciate sure. you working through this. And the man's got his relief or she's got her relief. And, you know, the couple stays to it. And, and there is no wounding in that, I don't think. The no is OK. It's mm-hmm. tolerable. It's, it's a partial yes mm-hmm. for the couple. So mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. It's a I, wonderful solution. Yeah. Or maybe I, I would say, you know, offer oral sex or something that maybe isn't as involving or, you know, maybe you touching your partner, but ne- it's not necessarily your night, but you can still give them pleasure. I mean, oftentimes it's actually harder for me to get the men who have low desire to go ahead and give to the female partner who mm-hmm. has higher desire, you know, pleasure that night. He's not into it. And it's like, OK, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, she is. You can still give her an orgasm. Why don't you try that? You know, I I think it is, you know, often harder for him because it's going to take him longer. But he doesn't necessarily have to feel sexual to give her sexual pleasure. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, today we've been talking about saying no without wounding your partner. We've got some great ideas from Lori Watson, sex therapist and author. I'm Tony Del Medico, psychotherapist. Uh, Lori, before we end, let's give our listeners a couple of tips on how to say no. Okay. Just the tip. Just a tip, Lori. Offer a rain check and then write it down, put it in your uh, calendar, make a note, but make sure you bring it back up on the date and the time that you suggested the rain check. Great. And my tip, and I'm a huge fan of this, is go ahead and masturbate. If you're in the moment and the heat and the energy is there as a couple, make that happen, arm in arm. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time for some more foreplay. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much.